putting a face on our nation's gun violence crisis. Welcome to the Convocations Program at Carleton College. I'm your host, Carrie Rott, Director of Events. Now we will be together for one hour and we'll include some time for questions. You may click on that Q&A button on your screen at any time to submit your question and then I'll pose them to our speaker at the conclusion of her presentation. Reverend Sharon Washington Risher was catapulted into the limelight after this Charleston, South Carolina shooting at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church on June 17, 2015. Her beloved mother and the church's sexton, Mrs. Ethel Lee Lance, was killed along with eight others, including two cousins and a childhood friend. Since that horrific tragedy, Reverend Washington has been speaking out about gun violence, racism, and hate in America. Her book, For Such a Time as This, Hope and Forgiveness After the Charleston Massacre, was published June 2019, coinciding with the four-year anniversary of the shooting. In sharing her incredibly raw personal experience, Reverend Risher also describes a path to forgiveness and offers hope for tomorrow. The title of her presentation is Tattered Pieces, A Charleston Daughter Explores Loss, Faith, and Forgiveness. Welcome, Reverend Rick. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for that uh, I get kind opening, kind words. I am definitely glad to be with each and every one of you in Zoom land today. It is definitely an honor to speak with you. In, in perusing your school's website and looking at uh, different images and reading, I came away with a thought of Carlton appears to be a place where a person can be and learn how to become who they are in a safe space. Definitely a blessing to be able to attend such a school. As we celebrate Black History Month, I'm reminded, and it came to my brains that the nine angels that was killed in that church almost six years ago is now a part of Black history. It's a part of America's story. In the years to come, my children's children and their children will one day be able to pick up a book and read about their elder, my mother, Mrs. Ethel Lance, and her life and death. For everything that I've experienced in my life, I'm a proud daughter of the American South, a true Geechee girl from the low country of Charleston, South Carolina, and a product of the civil rights era. My Southern black heritage has shaped me into the woman of faith I am today. But like many African-Americans from the South, I'm no stranger to the hate and intolerance that has unfortunately defined a large part of America's history. Losing my mother and my cousins in the most horrific manner while praying in a church because of the color of their skins has changed me and my family and the lives of the other families and so many other people. On June 17th, 2015, a 21-year-old white young man decided that that would be the day that he would go into Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church to shoot and kill as many people as he could. You see, he did months of research and preparation 
including several road trips to Charleston from Columbia, South Carolina, which is about 110 miles apart. He scouted out the church by riding by and finding the exits and the entrance of the church, plotting out his route. On that day, my family members and others were attending their regular Wednesday night Bible study. But see, it was different this particular night because the church had been having their quarterly conference in the AME church. Every quarter, all of the churches in that particular district get together to plan out the church's business for the next quarter. So that night, the church was full of people. My friend, Myra Thompson, who had just gotten her credentials to be a preacher in the AME church, was slated to give the Bible study that night. It would be the first time in that capacity that she would give the Bible study. The people left. And there was a discussion about whether they would continue to hold the Bible study because it had ran late. But those faithful few that stayed wanted to have Bible study and they wanted Myra to have the opportunity to lead that Bible study because she had prepared so much. They welcomed this young man into the church. He asked to be seated next to Reverend Pinckney, and that's where they placed him. They studied the Gospel of Mark, chapter four, the parable of the sower, and when they were ready for dismissal, they all got together in a circle, holding hands while their heads were bowed, eyes closed, and Dylan Roof, pulled out his Glock 45 and commenced to shooting them like they were animals. They fled and started to run, hide under the tables, but he followed them where they were and he shot each one of them multiple times. Miss Polly, who was one of the survivors, said he walked over to her while she was under the table praying. And he said, have I shot you? And she said, no. He said, well, good, because you will live to tell the story of what happened in that church. Five people survived and five people have to live with that tragedy in their hearts and in their minds every day. He robbed the community of Charleston of nine lives because of the hatred he felt because they were black. I continue to say their names because my mission in life now is helping other people know that hate won't win. I continue to call each name because they gave their lives for a higher purpose and should always be remembered. They are my mother, Mrs. Ethel Lance. My two cousins, Mrs. Susie Jackson and Tywanza Sanders. My childhood friend, Myra Thompson. The pastor of the church, Reverend Clemente Pinckney. Then Reverend Daniel Simmons and Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton. Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor and Cynthia Hurd. I pray that whenever you hear their names, you will feel empowered to invoke change wherever you are. Let me tell you a little bit about mama. She was a great woman of faith who worked all her life along with my stepdad, Nathaniel Lance, to provide for their five children. My mother encouraged each of us to pursue higher education because you see, she didn't finish high school but because she felt so strongly that education was the only way to make headway, she returned to night school 
and graduated the same year that I graduated from high school from the same school. I tell you, there were many nights where I did my own homework and helped my mother with her homework. My mother ended up with two of her children graduating from college and one of my sisters went on to be a cosmetologist. But we were accomplishing things my mother had always dreamed about. Her kids being able to take care of themselves and having an education. My mother was a praying kind of mother. She had a big heart and she was always willing to help somebody. She loved really nice perfumes. She loved dancing to James Brown when we all got together and formed a circle and we would just dance and laugh and reminisce. She kept a spotless house. She had a very strict work ethic. She worked for the city of Charleston for over 35 years. To have a job for the city was considered to having a good job. My mom was a no nonsense kind of woman. That's who she was. December 2016 came and we were set to start the federal trial. We had been through several delays already. So all of the family members, we were anxious because we didn't know what we were, were going to face. Of course, we had had several conversations with the federal lawyers and the state lawyers about what to expect. But we spent almost 10 days of sitting in a courtroom, listening and seeing every piece of evidence they had against, I felt like at that time was an evil person. How do we get the images out of our minds of their broken bodies as pictures of the crime scene came one after another? Witnessing the video of his tape confession where he laughed and reading his jailhouse rants and just on and on. We heard and seen things in that courtroom we will never forget. It's left an imprint on my brains and soul that will remain forever. I sat there day after day, feet away from him in that courtroom, trying to understand why. When I was given the opportunity to address him, this is what I said in my victim statement. I pray those nine angels will visit you in your cell every night to have Bible study with you. And before your life is over, I pray that you will call on the name of Jesus and ask for mercy. Finally, we received word that the jury had come back with their verdict. He was guilty on all 33 counts that included hate crimes. I had to tell myself to breathe. The other half of my brain was having a party while the other half feeling a deep sadness too. Sad because I had witnessed the judicial system more than once be unfair to African-Americans and people of color. This was a victory, not only for us, but for the whole country. The political climate we found ourselves in at that time did not give me confidence in a system that have oftentimes failed African-Americans. Finally, on June 10th, 2016, was the day that we would find out whether the jury had sentenced him to death or if he would spend the rest of his life in prison without parole. 
I had been very vocal about my feelings regarding the death penalty. Once I had to think about the death penalty and really understand what that meant, I knew in my heart that I didn't want that to happen, even to him, a person that we all felt was unforgivable. But then my faith tells me that the only person who could be judge and jury of anybody and my faith is God. I wanted to be faithful to the God that had gotten me through. I would lie if I said I didn't go back and forth wanting him dead. I sat next to one of my sisters in that courtroom and she was adamant about him getting the death penalty. Even though we had different opinions about what we wanted to see, I knew that giving him the death penalty would not bring my mother back. I realized that I could not stay in a human space, that I could not stay in my humanness because my faith and my heart told me thou shalt not kill. I was one of the few people who felt that way. I have talked with people who passionately wanted him to get the death penalty. But I began to accept the movement of emotions and feelings that I was trying to process. I had to be willing to move like a ribbon of steel, able to move fluidly, willing to recognize my humanness and stay in the spiritual, or I would go down a dark hole, fully doubting my beliefs and weakening my faith. That day, June 10th, 2016, he was given the death penalty. I'm so glad that it was not left up to me to decide his fate. I thank God for God's grace and mercy and said, God, I accept this judgment. I felt weak and nauseous. I was numb. The family members, we just sat there looking really crazy at each other because we knew regardless of what we wanted to happen, that those nine angels would have justice. And that courtroom that day, I knew that they were gone, but that day, they were truly gone physically, that I was not living in a dream. This was not some courtroom TV drama, that this was real and we were real people. That journey of moving towards total forgiveness had been hard and lonely and complicated. Right at the beginning, national attention was given to how great it was that the families gave the killer automatic forgiveness. The act of forgiveness was front and center, but the tone of that forgiveness was set 48 hours after the murder at Ruth's court arraignment hearing. My sister Nadine Collier was the first person to speak at that hearing and she said, I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. I will never get to talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. If God forgives you, I forgive you. 
I was still in Dallas, Texas at that time. Let me tell you, this was 48 hours later. They were killed that Wednesday night and they were in that courtroom hearing on Friday. I was still in Dallas trying to get my brains together, trying to make all the arrangements I could so I could fly south to get to my children and then travel on to Charleston. Charlestonians, people thought that we displayed such grace and mercy. But when I heard my sister's voice on the television, all I could do was scream and holler because I couldn't understand what was she talking about? We haven't even had time to process what happened. And these people are standing up one after another talking about forgiveness. I was heartbroken. But here I was, a woman of the cloth, talking about there is no instant forgiveness from me. I wanted time to process my thoughts and be authentic about how I felt. The media latched on between the differences of the sisters and wanted it to appear that we were estranged because of the differences. But that was not the case. Our family dynamics had changed since a sister had died in 2013. Things were strained already. So when my mom, when our mother was killed, our family was caught up in the horrific strain of her death. What other people think is the right Christian way to feel about such a heavy act. At that time, it was crazy. I decided right then it comes a time in our lives where we have to stand up for what we believe and be in that place for however long it takes. I had to feel what I felt and be good with that. I was not going to jump and hop on the forgiveness band wagon. I was in church one Sunday after I found enough strength to go to church. I think it was maybe six to eight months after everything had happened. I had even, I did not want to go to church. I was afraid to go to church. I was afraid of the feelings and feeling guilty about my back and forth feelings about him. But I was in church this particular Sunday the preacher preached, there was an awesome choir, and then he started to talk about forgiveness. My body got tensed. He told the congregation forgiveness should be instant and is not a process because God wants us to forgive instantly. My heart almost leaped out of my chest. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What about people like me that are struggling, trying to get there? Do you not have a word for us? I haven't found a scripture yet to tell me how long it takes. What about helping us get there? Help us to know that it's okay to work through such a heavy spiritual act that was not to be taken lightly. I wanted others to know that you can empower yourself to speak your truth, articulate how you truly feel, and you can allow yourself to go through whatever process it is that you need, and then to perform whatever acts you have to in order to forgive. In my heart of heart, I knew that I would forgive him I understand that forgiveness is one of the hallmarks of the Christian faith. I had to work hard spiritually to walk towards forgiveness. Holding on to the anger kept me fueled, but I knew that I had to let that go. Yet I never stopped praying and I never stopped yelling at God. 
And then on October the 1st, 2017, I was preaching in Martinsville, Virginia at a World Communion Sunday. It was a multi-faith service. I'm a manuscript preacher, so I was preaching and the words, I forgave you came out of nowhere, just came tumbling out of my mouth. My brains is scrambling, trying to figure out now what's going on, Sharon, trying to find my place of where I was preaching. All this time, my body is feeling this warm sensation. And in my brains, I could feel God saying, you have done the work, baby girl. You have done everything you need to do. So you could forgive him and go on and do the work that I'm preparing for you to do. But I want you to know, not everybody can forgive. And if there's anybody out there that has been wrestling with forgiveness, you could take your time. You, you're the only one who knows what's best for you. And if you're a person of faith, ask God to help you discern and get to a place where you could begin to live in some kind of peace and to not be able to hijack you emotionally because that's what grief and anger does. Not forgiving does, it hijacks you emotionally for however long that you deal with it. So whatever it is that you need to do for yourself and however long it takes for you to do that, that's on you. I just ask, that you be completely honest with your feelings. And if you need help in discerning what those feelings are, I ask you to find someone that you can talk to, that you feel safe with, someone who will not give you their judgment, but will give you a truth you may not have otherwise. It's been almost six years since that night and the lives have changed and we've found ourselves trying to figure out where do we go from here? How do we pick up the pieces of our lives that's been shattered into pieces? I don't know if I buried my head in the sand, but before the death of the nine in Charleston, I didn't realize so many people believed and followed a white supremacist, white nationalist ideology. Because of that blatant act of hate, I stand here today as an accidental activist, I call myself. But if you're of the Presbyterian persuasion, or if you're of the faith that says that nothing is accidental, that everything is predestined, then here I am. But I believe for people like me, we find ourselves living in life altering experiences, and then we spring into action for whatever causes or issues. Not every activist starts out with the goal of changing the world, but by bringing some change where they are. Some of us have had our lives changed and shaped by chance and quirks of timing and strange coincidences. But you see our unwillingness or simple inability to fully ignore the social injustices in the world or in our lives propels us into action. I have come to meet so many people that are activists that spend their lives talking about whatever issue that have affected their lives. 
But see, we find ourselves living in a time where the country has been divided more than it's ever been. People are living in fear and speaking out of their pain and confusion. The coronavirus has almost destroyed the way we live, and I wonder what our new normal will look like. African Americans are wondering who will protect our rights of the Constitution that we had to fight and be killed in order to have. Who will ensure that all people have the same privileges and rights as the next person? I say no matter what your political affiliations, people are living the fear or anger of things that are happening that we don't understand. And we are led to believe that this is the way our country should be. And we can either take it or not. Racism has been with us from the beginning of this country. It has reared its ugly head even more and more today. But I believe it's, time, it's our time to put our money and time into making this country for all people to have the opportunity to have the American dream. That people could worship in their churches and not be killed because of their faith and the color of their skins. As people of faith and me, a messenger of God's word, I truly believe we have a duty to begin and continue to have congregate have conversations about race and how congregations can truly be called to be the community, that somehow we can move towards that beloved community that Re Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King talked about. I believe that our churches can no longer sit on the sidelines while our sisters and brothers are in need. Dr. King understood the church had to step up. If our sisters and brothers are hurting, no matter where they are in the world, we hurt also. The church universal must not be quiet when it comes to racism and social injustices, no matter what the color of a person's skin is. I became involved in the gun violence prevention movement soon after being back in Dallas after all the funerals and all of those things. And I received a bunch of letters and cards in the mail that the church forwarded to me. And in that packet, there was one envelope that drew my eye. And that envelope contained a letter from Lucy McBath, who is now Congresswoman Lucy McBath. But at that time, she was just a mother who had lost her son to senseless gun violence. I don't know if you remember the case, but in Jacksonville, Florida, back in 2012, there was a stand your ground case that came about because a white man was not pleased with rap music coming out the Jeep of some teenagers on their Thanksgiving break. A tough conversation ensued and he didn't like the way the conversation was going. This man walked back to his car, brought his gun, shot into that car and killed Lucy's son, Jordan. She didn't ask me at that time to join the movement she was with. She was reaching out to me as someone who had been hurt more ways than you can ever count. And she kind of knew some of the feelings that I would have been going through having just lost my mother to senseless gun violence. We talked and we cried and she promised that she would continue to check on me. Well, through that connection, I became involved with Moms Demand Action and the Everytown Gun Safety Network. These groups are one of the largest grassroots advocacy movements 
in America. Moms demand action of working together to end violence and build safer communities. Gun violence touches every town and many lives. On the night of October 1st, 2017, a gunman opened fire on a crowd of concert goer at the night at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas, killing 58 people and injuring more than 556. We have the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, where another senseless shooting. I could go on and on and talk about the mass shooting. I could go on and on about the shootings that happen in our cities every day where more than 100 people are killed and more than 12 kids are killed every day because of gun violence. I have sat numbly almost two years ago when the shooting happened at Parkland. When those 17 kids were killed, I had just gotten off the road from speaking and had gotten back in Charlotte and was sitting on the couch and the special report flashed in. These kids were killed. It felt like my heart was torn again, not the same way like it was with my mother, but a deep, numb sadness because I knew what those parents and community and aunts and uncles and cousins, I knew the kind of terrible grief that they would have to endure. As I've said, and we have had politicians say over and over, we send our thoughts and prayers. Well, we need more than thoughts and prayers. We need people with big hearts that see that gun violence has now become a public health crisis. For far too long, we have been disillusioned by the Washington gun lobby and by leaders who refuse to take common sense steps that will save lives through gun law reform and legislation that will bring common sense gun laws to protect all. It has been said over and over that people like me want to take away a person's Second Amendment rights. But I'm here to tell you that is not what we're trying to do. There are many people that are involved in Moms Demand Action that are gun owners. We are just wanting people to be conscious about their guns, to understand that not everyone is responsible and that we have to have laws that will somehow help us curb the flow of guns in this country how easy it is for people to get a gun. And if you're truly, truly responsible, having a background check would not deter you from having a gun if that's what you need to have. People have said that this gun violence issue is not a political issue. Well, I believe it is a political issue, but more than that, I believe it's a hard condition. A hard condition because of gun violence in America does not make your heart hurt, cause pain in your soul, then I don't know what will. Well, I say now is the time. When will we realize more and more people die by gun violence through homicides, suicides, and unintentional shootings every day. See, all of us, we don't know. We can't live in a bubble. We can live in gated communities. We can have the best security systems. But I know if you're in the way of a bullet, it really doesn't matter. And we know now that it doesn't matter where you are. 
that you too can be hurt because of guns. In conclusion, Dr. King said, nothing will be done until people of goodwill put their bodies and their souls in motion. And it will be the kind of soul force brought into being as a result of this confrontation that I believe will make a difference. This journey that I've been on has taken me to places I never dreamed I would be. Talking to people like former President Barack Obama or being on CNN, being interviewed by Don Lemon and Wolf Blitzer, writing op-eds for the Washington Post, having helped make a documentary that was in the New Yorker titled Quiet No More. These are things that God has opened the doors for me to go around this country when I could, talking about what happened in that church, getting people to realize that to live through such a horrific event, the grief never goes away. You never know when a scent or an image will click in your brains and here comes a deep sadness. But you learn to deal with whatever it is at that time, the best way you know how, and to keep doing the right thing. There comes a time in all our lives where we will face some very challenging experience. How we decide to accept and press forward defines who you will become. I didn't ask for this journey I'm on. I would rather not be standing up here sharing this with you, but here I am. My book for such a time as this I'm gonna show it to you, was published in June, 2019. Writing that book was both joy and pain. This book came about because I wanted people to know that those people, those nine angels in that church that died were just not victims, that they were victors, that I'm not a victim that I'm a survivor, that there will be times in your life where you will go through such horrific things you never think you're able to come through it, but I'm a witness to tell you that you can. You can get through anything as long as you believe in yourself. And if you're a person of faith, let your faith and the love that you have inside you give you an opportunity to help change someone else's life. Thank you. And I appreciate you for being here in Zoom land today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to have you, uh, have you here with us. Um, you, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. And uh, one of these, uh, you referred to uh, gun violence as a public health crisis. And as we think about the uh, global response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, why are we not seeing the same sort of passion behind uh, resolving gun violence as a public health crisis? Well, we have, Washington has tried for so long, a lot of Washington, to make this gun violence issue a political issue. And because of that, and because of uh, the presidential elections we've gone through, we know that people could make you believe something that's really not true. Gun violence has gone up during COVID. There are more suicides that have happened because of COVID. 
people, this COVID have made people be in close quarters with other people. COVID has taken people out of work. Having a gun somehow makes a person believe that this is what they need to have in order to get back things. It's, it's, it's really uh, hard to understand, but the COVID has really um, spiked. There are more people waiting to get background checks than it's ever been. COVID have made people afraid. And when people are afraid, they want to have something in their minds that gives them some semblance of power. With that in mind, what do you see as um, the cure or the vaccine for gun violence? Well, first of all, we do need gun law reforms. I, right now, I'm going to speak before the Oregon State Legislature uh, on Tuesday to help drum up votes for the Charleston loophole, which came out of the tragedy in Charleston. The Charleston loophole is a bill that asked that the three day waiting period for a background check to be completed be expanded to seven or 10 days. And it's because of this. When Dylan Roof went to the gun shop to buy his gun, he had to fill out the paperwork to buy the gun. He had to have a background check. Well, if a background check is not completed in the three day window, the gun seller has the legal right to go ahead and sell that gun even though the background check had not been completed. It came out that Dylan Roof would have not been able to buy his gun because he had been convicted of a substance, a controlled substance. And because of that, a person that has a conviction on a controlled substance cannot get, buy a gun. If the days had been more than three, just maybe, just maybe I would have my mother and everybody else might be alive. So that's one of the things that I've been doing when it comes to uh, legislation. I've been a big proponent for the Charleston loophole. There are other uh, laws, the ERPO law, where it's an extreme risk protection order that some states have adopted where if a person has a known history of mental illness and if a family member or spouse feels that they're in danger and that this person has a gun, that extreme risk protection order can be in place. And that person's gun can be removed from them and maybe be given back after a particular time and after some investigation has been done into this person's um, ways and in, in if he's used this gun or not. So I believe if we continue to try to strengthen the loopholes that we have, that we continue to educate people to let them know that a gun is not what you need in order to understand someone else or to show that you have power. That's some of the ways I believe that we could curb some of the gun violence. Yeah. In the, in the wake of this tragedy, how did the community rally around this event and, and how could that promote gun control and gun safety issues? The community, I mean, the whole United States after this happened, I can't tell you how many letters and cards I received on social media. People, 
there are more people who are willing to not have a gun and to figure out what they could do to bring communities together than we can ever think about. All we hear about are the things that pull us apart, about all the gun violence that there is. But people are willing to go the extra mile, to do what they need to do to help this. And it's very strong, even if we don't see it. We have a, a, a whole United States out there that are willing to do something because they understand that no one is safe. How does your faith and your uh, understanding of forgiveness inform your gun control advocacy? My faith tells me that I am to love my neighbor as I love myself. My faith tells me that if I believe in a higher power and that my life has meaning and purpose, then I must be able to forgive and to do what I know that is right, not just for myself, but for other people too. And I go by that. Without my faith, without my understanding of God, I don't know if I would have come out through this like I am. I might have been somewhere still trying to get therapy or in a mental institution somewhere because living through that kind of grief can tear a person's mentally apart. And because I had that faith, I was able not to just stay in my grief and to find something that would be beneficial to everyone and not just myself. And that's how my faith informs the work I do because it's just not about me, it's about other people. The fact that Dylan Roof didn't want to be forgiven, did that make it harder to forgive him or did, does, would it have made a difference at all? It did make it hard. Let me tell you, when we were in that courtroom and we saw the video of the interview when he first got arrested, first of all, I'm gonna throw this out there. When they arrested him in Shelby, North Carolina, he had driven from Charleston to North Carolina to getting away. It was because a lady that worked in a florist shop who had seen the news saw his car and said to herself, wait a minute, that looks like the person they're talking about on the news. And she called it in. When they arrested him, they were not guns drawn. They walked up to him like he had had a traffic ticket or something. He was hungry. They stopped and got him Burger King and then took him to be interviewed by the FBI. And he started to laugh and giggle when they asked him, why did you shoot them? That's why it was so hard for me to forgive him. So yes, when something happens and that person won't ever acknowledge that it was wrong, that's when you have to dig harder into what you truly believe and that's where your faith come in. You know, I had called him every name under the sun, but when it came down to it, I had to realize that same God that I believed in, he was offering the same salvation to Dylan Roof. And so that's when I knew that I, I just could not not forgive him and not try to stay true to what I believe. After such a horrific tragedy, uh, the emotional, spiritual healing that is necessary, um, as you said, it's, it's a journey. 
Um, is it a journey that, that you think you will be continuing for the rest of your life? And how do you look at, um, at that journey down the road? I believe it is a journey for the rest of your life. Nobody that has ever lost someone in an unnatural way, you never get over that. You build upon what you can, you do the best you can, but you take it with you for the rest of your life. You know, I never thought that I would walk away from my dream job as a hospital chaplain. That was my dream job. I knew that I would be working in a hospital until I couldn't walk anymore. But now I know that in the midst of such things that sometimes the purpose God has set out for you changes. Just because you think you're going to do one thing, that doesn't mean that that's what you're going to do. So I don't know what this journey will be. I just know that I will continue to try to be purposeful, to make my life meaningful, to make sure that nobody ever forgets what happened to those nine people in that church and why they were killed, to be a part of something bigger than me. And that's where I see this journey taking me. I don't know where, but I'm willing. To, to ride the ride. What is the role of empathy in affecting change, empathy in, um, in, in activism? Well, you, if you can't feel what someone else is going through, then you can't really understand what's happening. I found myself, I'm going to tell you, feeling sorry for Dylan Roof. Can you imagine feeling sorry for him? But that's the empathy that I had because of who I am. I felt sorry for him because I thought, I felt like whatever happened in his young life, to make him get radicalized, to make him hate so much that something truly, truly bad happened to this young soul. If you're a person of faith, you cannot help but feel for him. So you have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, even if you don't agree with who they are and what they did. You have to be able to go beyond yourself and get in touch with those feelings. Yeah. Several in our audience have commented about what a moving and challenging uh, message you shared with us today, and I agree with them. Uh, Reverend Richard, would you have a closing comment for us today? For you young people, or anybody out there. One thing in your life should not define the rest of your life. In my book, I talk about being addicted to cocaine and marijuana. I talk about how my mother was raped as a 14 year old teenager and I was the product of that. So one thing that might have toppled you for a little while does not have to define who you are. That we could use all of the challenges that life has thrown at us to make ourselves better. And through that narrative, we can help someone else. And that's what I believe that God has put all of us here to do, to help somebody else. There's an old, there's an old spiritual that we would sing in church and I can't sing, but I'm gonna say the words of this. It says, if I can help somebody as I go 
alone, then my living will not be in vain. Thank yeah. you. It has been an honor to spend this hour with you. And to our audience, thank you all for being with us today as well. And please thank join you. us again next week when journalist and tech expert uh, Clive Thompson will discuss where do big ideas come from. In the meantime, stay well and be kind. Thank you. <laughs>